Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project Magnetic Reversal News and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum update. Sunday, January 16th, 9 p.m. Mountain Time, 2022. The models are showing storm after storm after storm pummeling the east and the southeast specifically. And that, well, that's the big story. And we're going to go live. Millions under winter weather alert as storm pummels the east coast. Two killed in a car crash on 95 North Carolina this morning alone. Keep calm. It's storm time. Let's go. Authorities in North Carolina have responded to more than 400 crashes since midnight. Oh, and that is a trucker's plight right there. Not looking good. Authorities in North Carolina have responded to more than 400 crashes. North Carolina State Highway Patrol spokesman Sergeant Christopher Knox told CNN they've responded to 444 collisions and 989 calls for service from midnight today. That is insane. So stay off the roads if you don't have to. Des Moines, Iowa sets new record. The storm dumps more than a foot of snow across central Iowa. Say it ain't snow, but it is. It's record snow. -a. Grab your shovels. Friday storm broke Des Moines' daily record for snowfall on January 14th with a total of 9.8 inches, according to data from the National Weather Service, before the highest snowfall on that day was in 1930, where it snowed just 5.7 inches. The Des Moines airport got even more snow than any other place in Iowa with a total of 14.7 inches, according to the National Weather Service, about 20 minutes northwest of National Weather Service office in Johnston. So record-breaking storm in Iowa, as we predicted. And the storm is still ongoing. Snowfall analysis to this morning shows some of that heavy snow in Iowa, that heavy plume. This is going to light up the map tomorrow, so stay tuned for more updates. Snow totals. Some Arkansas's were waking up to nearly a foot of snow. 12 inches in Canaan, 11.2 in Pindle, 9.5 in Deer, and just three, one to three elsewhere. So, very localized boom of snow in Arkansas, as predicted, a small bullseye. Snow totals for upstate South Carolina and western North Carolina. Snow still happening with midday totals here. Uh, as of Sunday night, Greenville's 5.5, Greer 6, Boiling Springs had 6, Spartanburg had 8, Malden 5, 9.5 in Traveler's Rest, 7 in Pickens, 5 in Simpsonville, 5.5 in Asheville. Used to live there. 10 in Hendersonville. 11 in Waynesville. 9 in Cashiers. And 10 in Saluda. So a Saluda to you, upstate South Carolina, western North Kakalaki. Snow is still falling. Now, how much snow did Nashville and Middle Tennessee get Sunday? Not that much. It was a fun day, though. Honewell, Lewis County, 5 to 8 inches. It was still snowing. Dixon had 4 inches, still snowing. Williamson County, 2 to 5, still snowing. But it's going to warm up there, so it won't be snowing for long. Now, power outages, many are claiming hundreds of thousands are without power, but this couldn't be further from the truth. They're lying. There could be 100,000, maybe 120,000 without power down in the southeast, but nothing spectacular. North Carolina, the big winter chicken dinner with 40,000 outages. But as a whole, I mean, let's take a look. There's 4.6 million customers and just 40,000 without power. So that's they're holding up pretty well. Well, let's look at the... National Weather Service, winter storm, travel hazards from the Mid-South to the Northeast. It's looking like a nightmare. Heavy snow and ice accumulations are likely to produce hazardous travel down trees and power lines. Heaviest snow is expected along just west of the Appalachians. The most damaging icing is likely across parts of North Carolina. Thunderstorms may produce damaging winds and tornadoes in Florida and the eastern Carolinas, but that's waning now. Strong winds and coastal flooding is also expected. So heads up, go to weather.gov, click on your county to get up local information on what is going on. Now let's come over to the GFS model. It is looking quite epic. And so this storm system is going to continue to move up the East Coast through Monday into Tuesday. And by that time, it will have hit Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, upstate New York, western PA quite heavily. West Virginia and snowshoes going to be picking up tons of that snow uh, for the next 24 hours. So it's going to be epic skiing up there. Tuesday. Into Wednesday, here's your Thursday. There's going to be some snow moving down to the Rockies Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's looking like an exploding southern storm potentially in Texas to move across the southeast and back up the northeast. And then another one following that. So pretty fantastical, don't you think? And we're back like crack and we're not whack.
but we are down in the bottom corner here. Thank goodness Starlink and our massive upload speed. I can do anything I want on an instant in a whim. Seismic update. No quakes of no 3.2 kicking off in Petrolia. 5.3 in uh, Pedro, Juamela, Mexico. And another significant 6.1 in Punga, Papua New Guinea. Not, actually, not significant. Insignificant. No quakes in note. The most significant quake would be out here um, in Greece where there could be some damage with the 5.5 happening moments ago. So no quakes in note. Uh, Tonga. We'll get to that at the end of the video. We've got some amazing footage of the shockwave heard around the world. Now, space weather news update. We've had geomagnetic storm in and out for the last 24 hours, uh, six hours at a time. And you can see the reverberation is getting less and less. So we shouldn't expect any geomagnetic storm activity moving forward uh, in the future, except we do have some sunspots facing towards Earth and we could see some uh, solar flare activity happening in the days to come. So stay tuned for updates on that. That's a fact. Now, we're going to talk about the volcano eruption that created shockwaves that passed through Colorado and around the world. That's the Hunga Tonga Blast. And it actually caused a pressure wave to move around the world, hit the antipode, and now reverberate back around. Just happened hours ago, the reverberation from the volcanic explosion. So you know this was a big one. And it was followed by tsunamis and some other stuff. And it was, well, a fantastic eruption that we all experienced a uh, geologic phenomenon in our lifetime that is, well, worthy of deeper exploration. So that's where we're going to go now. Tonga volcano filled around the world. The absolutely stunning eruption here. And we did report the, on this on a different update here, but Alaska, the U.S. National Weather Service in Anchorage confirmed that the boom people heard in Alaska was from Tonga. That's 6,000 miles away. So... 5,819 to be exact, uh, similar to the Krakatoa explosion. And there was a sea level air pressure anomaly reported in Anchorage. And in, in fact, all stations around the entire planet reported this. Now, this is some amazing uh, information coming out just moments ago. The Hunga Tonga High Pay Volcano, the latest measurements confirmed 30 kilometer column height, which contained 0.4 TG of SO2. Now, good news is that that probably won't cause climate change. There's just not enough aerosols there up into the stratosphere to cause climate change. But it, it will be present. It will cause definite weather changes and some slight cooling, in my opinion, especially because this eruption, well, is still ongoing. Now, according to the Ozone Mapping and Profiler Suite, OMPS, LIDAR-based satellite measuring of the global distribution of ozone as remote sensing method. It seems the eruption column height was at 30 kilometers. It reached the stratosphere. And based on measurements of SO2 concentrations, the atmosphere detected the total mass of 400,000 tons. Not enough for climate impacts. We'd be looking for 1 million or more for that. But in the impressive SO2 plume ejected in the volcano on the 15th of January, it was quite impressive. And so that's what's going on there. And we do have the data. What is this picture? SO2 concentrations in the column. And that you can see here Tonga. This is where it emanated from, and it was drifting to the west. So a huge boom and a historic one at that. And we are watching science in motion, folks. Now, Hunga Tonga Haipei, I told you that the shockwave moved across the world, but here is the proof that the shockwave came back around. A resonance almost 12 hours later, 15 hours. It took to get to the other side, so 15 hours back. Now, the United States Geologic Survey detected another pass of the atmospheric pressure wave that was being recorded around the globe. It's completely mind-blowing that this actually made another pass. And that's amazing. The attached image contains the infrasound records from three cascade volcanoes. Red box is the initial airwave from Tonga. Gold box is the airwave that came around on its second lap. And, well, just fantastic. And we do have some video footage of those shock waves that we're going to share with you. And But before we do that, we will pause. So a lot of people were complaining that we have such low resolution video, but that's not the case anymore. We're running in 4K and I'm doing this live. Hey, hey. And huge Tonga underwater volcano eruption captured in studying 
satellite imagery, and we're going to share some of that with you. Uh, not from this. We'll leave you links to this uh, article for yourself. And in fact, we won't use, well, let's just look at space.com real quick, see what they got to show us. How about that? I did turn the audio off for a number of reasons. Um, boom! Simply because it may be copyright, and we are sick of copyright strikes and being demonetized and out of the algorithm. Now, since we've been remonetized, we're back in the algorithm. We've had over 100,000 views in the last 36 hours because of the Tonga eruption and our coverage of it, which shows us how important that algorithm is to get this information out to the masses. And you're seeing some of the satellite imagery, and there you can see the shock wave. Let's go back to that because we're going to be looking at this shock wave analysis. Boom, and there it is. That ripple, the shock wave felt around the world, and this is from space.com.com. Dot com. So that's pretty fantastic. Now, the second video we have lined up here is high resolution iGadget Pro, Hunga Tonga. This is different aspects of the eruption and in high resolution. And we're going to be taking a look at some of the, this footage here. We'll just let it run through. And there you can see the shockwave here, a little less visible, but clearly visible. So just some fantastic footage we have here of the blast and the shockwaves. Now this is a nice, you get a nice shockwave here. See that? Wow, what a fantastic angle of the dangle there. Absolutely fantastic. Some of this footage. Now, the final video we're going to show you here is uh, what this guy did was he took some time to figure out how to uh, make that shockwave look a little bit better. And uh, he did an amazing job here. And he posted this up on Twitter, and a lot of people wondered how he did it. Um, he just used positive and negative views, and the eruption is going to be happening down here. And you can see that shockwave go out, and he was looking for a way to make it more impressive. Look at the plume moving west. Just amazing. And so we're going to see some of that enhanced shockwave footage. You can see the shockwave moving out from there now. And you, you can see how it reverberates all the way across the globe here. I'm just going to replay that for you. This footage here, boom, that ripple effect. Absolutely amazing. Another one. So you can see the shockwave moving across the entire globe. Absolutely awesome. And let's do it one more time. There's the shockwave there, and then here's the enhanced across the entire planet. Wow. That's just a wow moment for any human alive. This is a, a very significant geologic event that we've all experienced and survived, by the way. We live through the shockwave, and it's just a testament. Well, we, we're not going to show that. We all saw that the other day. So amazing links below to these videos. Uh, give all the channels a thumbs up and a like. Um, subscribe if you could. And that just shows your support. Now, we'll move on with some final science before we finish up tonight. The first bioengineered hybrid animals discovered in antiquity. And this is through archaeological work. And these are ancient Mesopotamia bioengineered animals. And they were called kungas. And a lot of the carvings in Mesopotamia, the Anunnaki and others, using kungas here. These are the kungas. And they were a sterile bioengineered animal, like a donkey or an ass. Or like a mule. I think it's a mule I'm going for. I think a mule is a donkey and an ass. I don't know. I just be, might be making an ass of myself. But Mesopotamians were using hybrids of domesticated donkeys and wild asses to pull their war wagons 4,500 years ago. And I think we do it today. And we call them mules. I think so. I'm not a mule expert, but I will be at some point in the future. Now, this is at least 500 years before horses were bred for the same purpose. And it kicks back everything further back. And now we're back almost 5,000 years ago when we're making hybrid animals to pull wagons. Yeah, we just figured that out on a whim. <laughs> now, from the skeletons, we knew they were equids, horse-like animals, but they did not fit the measurements of donkeys, and they did not fit the measurements of Syrian wild asses. 
Thank goodness. Those are some big asses. But the study co-founder, Eva Marie Guille, a genomicist at the Institut Jacquet Monde de Paris, said they were somewhat different, but was not clear what the difference was. And so genetic analysis proved that the Kungas were strong, fast, and yet sterile hybrids of female domestic donkeys and male Syrian wild asses. Who knew? Or as Hemun, the equid species native to the region. So the new study shows, mind-blowingly, that the first bioengineered hybrid animals were from Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. Now, what it means to me as an open-minded scientist in this field of hidden history and cosmic catastrophe is that, yes, the hybridization of animals goes far back, much further back than this. And we're just waiting for the paper, which won't be a paper, by the way. Now, the solar system exists in a giant mysterious void, and we finally know why. Well, if we read the paper, we know what they think is why, and it's complete nonsense. Now, we will be doing a podcast uh, on magnetic reversal news in the future on the giant mysterious void and what our interpretations of it are. But let's just read some of the nonsense that they have to say. This really is an origin story. For the first time, we can explain how all nearby star formation began. The local bubble was only discovered relatively recently in the 1970s and 80s through a combination of optical, radio, and X-ray astronomy. Gradually, these surveys and observations reveal a huge region, 10 times less dense than the average interstellar medium. Since we know supernova can carve out cavities, well, they think the bubble is caused by supernovas. And uh, amazingly, wait for it, our solar system happens to be in the very middle the very middle, and it's by accident. By complete accident is what they say. The reason our solar system in the, is in the middle is a complete accident. You have to read this article. It's complete nonsense. Well, what are the other stars that supernova to create the bubble? Well, they don't say that either. They just say that we happen to be directly in the middle by accident. And that's what the uh, podcast that I'll be doing in the future is going to be discussing the local bubble, the position of the sun, and the fact that uh, the thousand-year light-year bubble, which they say has been created only in the last, let's say, 14 million years, and we happen to just migrate through here. And we went through the sheath here with no effect. I guess that didn't harm us at all. Now we just happen to be sitting directly in the middle of the bubble. Now there is some very high-tech software, but you need high-speed internet to access it. <laughs> Thank God we have it. And we'll be doing some 3D um, integrated videos to basically show you, look at this. So the sun is the X here. And all we're doing is we're just moving this map around. I think I might have to click another. Oh, no, there we go. And so we can see the position of our solar system in this bubble. And now the plasma sheath is so thick around the bubble from subsequent uh, supernova from our solar system that it's create uh, an accumulation of debris, let's say. And, and that debris then coalesces into stars. So we have ama amazing amounts of star formations at the edge of this bubble, which is caused by supernova explosions, but not from our sun. We just are accidentally directly into in the center of this bubble, and we our sun doesn't supernova, according to them. <laughs> so that's a boom to knowledge. Hope you got something out of the video. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. When the mainstream scientists are lying directly to your face, because NASA and the Apollo mission was happened in the when? The 70s. And that's exactly when they knew about the local bubble. And they went up there to find out if our star novas, if our star novas, the evidence would be on the moon. And that's why they, the moon program exists, to find out about our sun novaing. And guess what? Not a single human on Earth is being told about it by anyone at the highest levels. That's why channels like the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News exist to unveil the lies. Subscribe to the channel. Share this with like-minded people. And be safe. Thanks to all our one-time donors, our Patreons. Be a hero and share the video. We love you. That's a boo. Mm -hmm.